This is Economic Impact. Conversations from Emirates Development Bank. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to Economic Impact, a conversation with Emirates Development Bank with regards to the economic development agenda of the UAE with key players in the economic ecosystem. I'd like to welcome today the CEO and co-founder of House of Pops, Mr. Mazen Kanan. Welcome. Thank welcome you. Welcome to the Thank conversation. You. Thank you for having me. Uh, Mazen, if we just jump right into it, um, can you give us a bit of a background about um, how you got to the point of starting a popsicle company? You know, what, how did that come onto your mind? Why was that the concept that you decided to go with? What was the background to that? Hello, thank you again for uh, having me on uh, on this podcast. Um, so, actually, I don't know how, how long back we need to go, but initially, I always had in my mind that, you know, I want to do something on my own. But I was waiting for the right opportunity or something that really clicks well uh, with me. And then I have started my career working with Unilever, um, the uh, multinational FMCG. And the last six, seven years, I was working on ice cream. And this is where I found that there is a gap in the market for something which is healthy and tasty at the same time. Right. At that time, the health and wellness was a trend that was spreading all across all the different industries and segments. You would go to the supermarket, you will find those high protein cookies, right. keto brownies, a lot of protein. But when you go to the ice cream, you will still find the high fat, high sugar, high sugar product. Right. And then I said, okay, then, you know, there could be an opportunity. So together with my, uh, with my wife, now she's my wife. At that time, she was uh, my friend. Um, we decided, okay, let's jump into it. And she also has a background in culinary. She did culinary mm. studies. Fantastic. So we thought that this is a good match. I know the category. I know how to market it. She knows how to cook. So let's, uh, let's give it a shot. And then uh, this is how it started. In 2018, in September 2018, we went to the farmer's market, tripe market here in UAE for the first time on September 8th. Actually, in, in three days, it's going to be our fifth anniversary. Fantastic. Congratulations. So um, I always like to put it that we went there. It was just the two of us with a small bike and a big dream. Mm-hmm. So, um, so yeah, this is how it started. Then there was a good traction and then um, we um, started expanding through different channels mm-hmm. and the growth started happening. So in the very beginning, um, going from the concept stage of having an idea, and as you said, I mean, it's, it's fantastic. You seem to have found the right partner in the sense of a culinary um, um, student uh, who actually understood how to possibly put the flavors together and how to actually put it together. How do you go from that to an actual reality of business? What were some of the hurdles or the challenges that you had to face in those early stages when it was still just a concept in your mind? Um, what were the things? So I'm, I'm assuming, again, with your experience with Unilever, you probably had a good understanding of the numbers, uh, what the expenses would be, what the, um, let's say, investment would have to be. Uh, was there anything that was a surprise to you? Anything there that you, you know, jumped out at you while you were trying to set up the business and you were like, whoa, I didn't expect this? Okay, so um, in Unilever, the things that I got was more related to the category, understanding the category right. and how to market ice cream and how to build a brand okay but it's a totally different environment when you want to start your own thing because your liver does not prepare you to that actually right. i don't know if anything prepares you to that right right um you need to be a bit foolish because if you start you know checking all the realities okay i'm going to start we said we're going to open a factory no one knows how to open a factory or anything mm. so there is this kind of foolishness a bit it helps in the beginning mm. so um so initially some of the challenges we had of course, was uh, so I had savings, you know, for um, around 13 years. I invested bit by bit my savings there. But the challenge was always, when do I know that this is a business that's going to last so that I invest a lot there? I read a nice book called um, um, The Lean Startup. It's a beautiful book. Good book. And I was inspired by the way that, okay, you need to go step by step. So I tried to follow this as much as possible. Initially, we started with a capex of Mm -hmm. $10,000. We got $3,000 worth of equipment from China. Mm -hmm. Very basic. And then in this warehouse that we got in Umul Kiwen, we set up the operation in, um, in the office room because we didn't need to use all the space. And then slowly, slowly we started expanding. So one, the first challenge is really the cash, cash flow management. The second challenge was once you start growing, 
uh, or if you want really to expand, people need in the trade to take you seriously. If I want to go to Kite Beach, I'm telling them I want to have a location there. They did not hear about uh, House of Pops. Right. So how to come across as, as a brand. And the third element was attracting the right talent. Uh, because, yeah, if you want to get someone with good experience, people will find it very risky to leave their job and join us. Right. But there are some elements that help us. I think one of the biggest help was uh, COVID. Yeah. Um, in a way that, so first in terms of being able to find real estate where we can go and establish, I started reaching out to real estate or people who are managing the real estate companies here um, in June uh, 2020, where everyone everything was shut down. Mm -hmm. But I thought, okay, it's going to open at some point. And they need tenants there. Right. So I went and started doing deals. So I did three, four deals between JBR and Kite Beach. So then that was one thing. And then also COVID impacted how the young generation see companies and see their careers. And they were more prone to leave multinational companies to work in startups that align with their values. And we can Absolutely. elaborate on those points yeah. as well. But those are the challenges. They call it the great resignation. So, exactly. so many people definitely during COVID, I think, had a chance to sit back, evaluate where they were in life, what they wanted from life, and then potentially, you know, make uh, career changes, you know, drastic career changes and different directions. And a lot of them definitely went into entrepreneurship as well. Uh, you said some interesting um, things, and, and I, I, I just want to ask that question. Um, you said how to come off a, as a brand, right? So when you were approaching some of these um, entities, I think this is very important for entrepreneurs to understand because um, when you're sending a pitch or a proposal, to let's say Kite Beach or the managers of, of Kite Beach um, in order to get a, a location, they obviously want to ensure that there's the best quality uh, or standards of a company coming to set up the F&B, whatever it is that, that they're setting up. So how did you do that? How did you ensure that you came off as a established brand when you were still in very early stages, obviously, at that point? Exactly. So that took a lot of marketing, I would say, skills mm -hmm. to be able to land it. So if you go to Kite Beach, there were around four or five ice cream brands, because ice cream is not an innovative category. Right. Everywhere you go, especially on the beaches, it's, there are plenty of offering. So then the way we entered that we are not an ice cream. Mm. No, no, Mahna, we are not competing. Mm. We are a fruit on a stick. Mm. You know, it's mm. a healthy thing. So I played a lot on two elements, the naturalness of the product and the sustainability. Because now with these days, and especially in UE, there is a lot of focus on sustainability and every company have a sustainability target. So we're saying, okay, you know, if you bring us in, we can help you achieve uh, or achieve a bit on those sustainability targets that you have because our packaging does not have any plastic and the product is, is healthy. Uh, it has less sugar. It's healthier, let's say. So those two things uh, coming across as a different, creating another category for, uh, for ourselves. And it was not easy. And I needed to have, I mean, like God or luck or put people in my way in those companies that really wanted to give me a chance. And they were fighting internally to get it done. To, to get it done. So this is a blessing. Yeah, yeah. Um, definitely. I would say that people underestimate how much employees in these organizations, mm -hmm. if they personally believe in you, if you sell yourself and sell your brand in a way where they will believe in it, um, that could be the difference between something getting approved through that company versus you know getting the, the wall of silence essentially. Yes, exactly. um, that first day when you approached and you and you set up your cart in the uh, food uh, ripe food yes. market, uh, that's the ripe food market that's down by uh, opposite of Burj Al Arab down um, by the Medina Jumeirah over, uh, over there. Uh, at that time, it mm -hmm. was during still the last month of the summer. They it, they were doing it in the mall in Times Square. In Times Square, okay. So this is where we started before okay. moving outdoor into in the, the yes. uh, uh, police academy. The police now. academy location, exactly. Yes. So how was that? How was the reception to your product? Um, how did you see people approach your stand? Um, I personally love your product uh, because of the, um, I, I know you say that it's not an innovative category, but what I found innovative about your, your uh, popsicles was the combination of flavors, which I do want to ask how you came to those um, combinations. Uh, but before that, how was the reception to the actual, uh, you know, little stand that you had yes. set up that first day? And, and what did you guys experience that first day? Was it a success? Was it a failure? How did it go that day? 
it's it's a memorable day of course because mm. we have opened the factory or took over this production unit back in april and from april to september we're just experimenting uh we did some tasting internally with friends etc but then the real deal came on september 8th and uh from it starts from nine to five from nine to one we didn't sold any piece okay. and we were like must okay. have been very demoralizing yes <laughs> and then from one o'clock till i think three four o'clock we sold like 100 and it was like 2000 and we were what 2000 and you know you start calculating if 2000 per day if i multiplied by 30 this is 60,000. you know so yeah, yeah, yeah. we got extremely excited that day and uh, of course so trial was generated by the branding mm -hmm. because and then once people uh, try it and then understand the product and the health benefits then this would the taste would drive repeat mm -hmm. so it was very important for us to lend a good branding uh, mm -hmm. to attract people and drive trial and then uh, a repeat will come with the product it was really good and we learned a lot it was very important for us to be um, face to face with the consumer mm -hmm. because a lot of misconception would say okay i want to launch a product let me go and start in the trade in Carrefour, in Lulu, mm -hmm. in all those uh, supermarkets. But then your brand will get lost. You know, you cannot right. really drive it and you will not really understand the feedback. Right. We stayed four years before entering the trade because it was very important for us to stay, to be with the consumer in their moment of consumption. Mm -hmm. And one of the feedback, for example, building on your point, uh, we were very happy that, yeah, it's healthier, there's no refined sugar, etc. And one lady at that time came said, I love your product and I love that you don't use sugar, mm -hmm. but I would rather you use sugar, but don't use plastic in your packaging. Mm -hmm. And it was a, a, a key moment. We said, okay, she has a point, like you cannot just be good for yourself. And she led us to really go and change the packaging after six months from launching to move into more sustainable things. So this is the beauty of being, you know, uh, on the in the market phase. What's the packaging made of now? It's made. It's called BOPLA, bioxyly oriented polylactic acid. It's made of plant starch. Plant starch, okay. And it can be decomposed in six months into air and a sole nutrient and CO two. Great, great, great. Yes, as you rightly said, you know, it's not just about being good for yourself, mm -hmm. but being good for everybody. Um, so back to the flavors. How did you come up with that kind of a uh, flavor profile? Because you know, one of the things that caught my attention um, a year or two ago when I first tried House of Pops was, uh, I think it was the mango passion fruit, which is yes. a very, very good yes. combination for me. But, you know, there were some other combinations there that I found very, very innovative in, in a sense. So how did you guys come to, come to that? So initially, in our category, you need to have a wide range, you know, because a wide range drive excitement and people get excited, you know, what do I want to choose? You'll always have the basic flavors that will sell the most mango chocolate strawberry mm -hmm. but then you need to have to drive excitement and this is where marcella's feed uh, marcella my wife uh, background she comes from costa rica mm -hmm. and the tropical fruits and the tropical flavor is something like in her Makes blood sense. even she is like very uh, like full of flavor she's very active she's right. so she put a lot of herself and her character into the f uh, the flavors and what you mentioned for example the passion fruit it's a big um, a big fruit a big flavor in um, in uh, in latin america mm. they call it maracuya mm. so uh, it was we call it mango mara mm. uh, so that so she was driving all those uh, um, flavors. Some of them worked perfectly. Uh, some like we had a tropical fruit. It did not really work well. So there right. was a lot of trial and error. Right. Um, and we were very flexible. Whatever works, we keep and we keep re-innovating. And it's very interesting that how the category works because people uh, would be saying, ah, did you hear House of Pops have launched this new charcoal lemonade? Mm -hmm. Oh, you need to try it. They go, ah, it's very interesting. Uh, it looks very nice. Uh, can I have mango, please? And you know? <laughs> right. So uh, those new addition flavors bring excitement yeah. and bring you to the shop. Yeah. But then they a lot of time you go safer, back to your... Safer, uh, yes, to the options that, that you like. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's great. Um, and like I said, I think that, uh, as you rightly said, that kind of innovation attracts the attention. Um, especially in a very competitive market mm -hmm. where you probably have a lot of uh, alternatives that you could go for, but all the alternatives typically are standard. You know, you, you expect certain flavors that are available. Um, I was curious, you know, so I had a chance to visit your factory uh, a few weeks back. It was a fantastic visit. 
very different to the majority of the factories that I tend to visit um, in the sense of, you know, the industrial uh, scale and walking in with a lot of machinery and a lot of heavy equipment and so on. What, what struck me when I walked into your factory was immediate whoosh of the fantastic smell of fresh fruits. Um, I loved it. I mean, it immediately put me in a good mood. Um, how did you guys go about setting up the factory, establishing it and building it to the scale that you've reached now? where uh, relatively uh, uh, large scale mm-hmm. in the sense of the freezers, the cold storage, yes. uh, even the, the processing that you have for the, for the pops themselves. Um, talk me through a bit of that journey and how you got to where, where you are now. Yeah. Initially, as I mentioned, we started in uh, Umm Al-Kiwain in the free zone there, and it was a hundred square meter, a uh, thousand square, a hundred square feet uh, warehouse. And we started, you know, increasing the machine number of machines and the equipment there but after three years we thought okay we are getting bigger and we deal with a lot of hotels we are looking to export certification is extremely important for you to get the right quality and to communicate you know i am certified i have all those certification and our operations in omul qn reached a limit where you can only get hasap and we, at that time, also recruited uh, a great talent from IFCO, uh, who was a factory manager. When he came to Omul and he said, listen, it's amazing, but I cannot sign on like being ISO or things. There are some standards we need to adhere by. And then we said, OK, now it's the time to move out. And one thing was good, because there in the free zone, whenever you want to ship internally, you pay a certain tax, 5%, 2.5%. Uh, and then with the growth of the business, this extra payment that we are uh, uh, getting would rationalize renting a bigger uh, right. uh, a bigger uh, facility. And of course, we go back to the challenge of uh, cash flow and how can you invest uh, the money. And then we are very lucky, I think, to be in a country like UAE where there are uh, institutions like EDB who would come um, at the right time and say, OK, you know what, you have a business, you have potential. We are ready to pitch in because it's not easy to get uh, to get funding financing. Uh, and financing. I mean, mm-hmm. the first finance I got from a bank was 21 percent interest. And uh, but, I, you know, you were squeezed and I want, didn't want really to get into equity financing. We can discuss about it I, as as long as I could uh, uh, drive. But then, yes, EDB came into the way and then uh, it helped us finance. And now we have, like you said, a beautiful uh, facility and that is future proof so um, we are ready for the future with that fantastic so up until then you were um, pure equity um, and then you know the financing was mainly used for the expansion of the facility and the equipment and the ability to pre- to increase your production yes and to invest behind assets so i put my savings mm-hmm. uh, plus uh, after some time so actually when i left unilever and i started the business i took another job so for mm. three years in parallel i was working in another company and then channeling the fund because it's expensive. Ice cream is uh, heavy on assets. You need to buy freezers. Now we have more than 350 freezers between carts and freezer, etc. So yes, the savings went there. And then also we got access for funding in order to get assets and uh, um, work on cash flow and uh, to build the factory. Okay, okay. That's great. Mazen, I'd like to ask you, what advice would you give to an entrepreneur, young or someone who's potentially, you know, starting out maybe a little bit later in life, but what would be that advice that you would give them on what they should do in order to start up a business? I would um, reply based on my, my experience. I think the first advice is that they definitely need to find a gap in the market uh, because without it, it will be extremely expensive to be able to generate trial or make your product work. And if there is a niche, uh, then yes, you can, you know, try to enter and try to dominate there. So number one is to find a gap. Second is I think to look not only for the functional benefit, but more for the emotional reward that the product or the proposition will give. Because people get more attracted and engage with emotional proposition rather than the pure functional and the functional anyone can copy it like our ice cream if you get three scientists or three food technologists together for 
one month, they might get 70% a similar product. But the way we communicate the brand, this is what will make it unique and will build um, the wall. And third, I think you should go with the lean startup approach, as I, uh, I mentioned. Don't over-invest and throw your money. Uh, step by step, you'll get some positive feedbacks and you grow the brand in the same way that the feedback is coming. So those, I think, are the three main ones. And then I think one very important check is that you should be passionate about something because they'll find a lot of challenges along the way. And if you don't have this passion, it will be very difficult to wake up next day and say, okay, you know, I'm going to face those challenges again. Right. What, what are your plans for COP28? This is now obviously the year of sustainability. House of Pops, as you rightly said, um, takes that very seriously with the materials that you use, um, with the flavors that you use and, and the natural materials that you, that you use to produce your popsicles with. So how are you, uh, you know, looking to leverage off of COP28, leverage off of the year of sustainability? Um, and, and what are your plans over the next few months? So um, we are very excited that COP is happening in UAE this year, and it's something extremely relevant to us. So we are going to be present. First, we're going to have our ice cream sold around COP. So that's one, 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 one element. We have contracts in place. Uh, another element, we are going to be also taking part in some of the discussions that are relevant. How can you be, uh, even as a startup, how can you grow a conscious brand and be environmentally friendly? And also in our journey uh, of sustainability, the packaging is just the starting point. Mm -hmm. uh, we are very keen on taking it to the next level. We want to understand more uh, our uh, carbon footprint, okay? Sorry, of the factory, of our operation. Because also the gas that we are using in the, in the freezers is a critical element. We are using gas, which is R290. Mm -hmm. It has a very low uh, global warming potential of three compared to 2,000, 2,500 of other gases. Mm -hmm. Even the shirt and the shorts of our promoters are made from recycled plastic bottles. It's another uh, partnership with D-Grade um, where we are working together uh, on that. And we do a lot of recycling uh, of the uh, material that we are using in the factory. We discussed briefly about also using solar systems, uh, right. solar panels to bridge this gap of, um, of, of energy. We are facing some struggles from the infrastructure, but we are trying to explore different options. So we are all in in this, um, in this journey. And this uh, having COP this year gives us a lot of momentum. And I think also you mentioned that you have a lot of support for those initiatives as well in EDB. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, definitely working alongside partners like yourselves, uh, looking to support more um, clients who are in the renewable space and the sustainability space. Um, it's part of the mandate of EDB. So we will be there alongside you, inshallah. Um, now, going back into, let's say, more of the future for House mm -hmm. of Pops, what are you looking to do? Um, you know, I'm sure there's still a lot to do here in the UAE, but I'm sure that you also have your eye probably on the GCC, on the export market. Um, so generally speaking, what do you see for the future of House of Pops? And, and by the way, are you looking at other lines of products? You know, is it just going to be the popsicles or are you looking at some other things there? Um, and then what do you plan on doing for the future on all these things? I think I've never been more confident about the future of House of Pops as much as I am today. Uh, we, celebrating five years now, uh, one of the major milestones is that we got a check, a confidence on the brand, on the flavor, on the value that we are offering, but more importantly on the team. Um, we just recently offered um, a, a, a candidate the... Um, uh, for him to come and be the head of finance. And with him coming, we'll have a full board ready to really drive. And now we have um, Shahid joining us as head of finance. And he has worked on Baskin Robbins in Saudi and on overdose and different startups. So with this team, we can deliver, I think, 10 times the revenues that we are currently delivering. Now it's just about, you know, because... You can get growth, but you need to be able to integrate it well. Right. We have also a factory that can accommodate five, six times the current production. Mm -hmm. So everything is ready to drive the growth. So how will the growth come? Number one, uh, so we have three pillars we have defined. Number one is by brand building and uh, um, uh, brand expansion into different formats, as you rightly said. So we are going, we are going to launch our first 
communication, real communication campaign with a film that we shot in, uh, in, in Lebanon in October. And we are going to uh, increase the formats. So initially, we were very focused on the popsicles format. Now we are developing cups, okay. pints, okay. bites mm -hmm. uh, as well. Uh, and this is going to really give us a huge room for growth in terms of the uh, formats. The second part is developing and growing geographically through partnerships with two kinds of partners. One would be distributors to distribute in the supermarkets and second would be franchisees. Mm -hmm. And then third is using this extra capacity that we have in our factory in order to drive private label. And this private label, we, are, we have already projects ongoing and we are taking part in private label exhibitions and conferences to get more uh, uh, businesses. Now, what's our current footprint? So outside UAE, we have now uh, Al Muayyad as a partner in, uh, in Bahrain, uh, as a uh, franchising partner, and we are developing the market with him. In Saudi, we have uh, almost finalized uh, a contract to open 80 outlets in the coming six years, part of a master franchising uh, agreement, which going, there is a huge potential in Saudi. The same discussion is ongoing in Kuwait, Qatar, Bahrain, uh, Kuwait, Qatar, and, um, and Oman. So um, GCC is the first priority. The second priority will be going to Europe. Um, uh, we, are, we have booked in CJEP, which is the biggest ice cream exhibition in Europe, in uh, Italy, in Rimini. We're going to be exhibiting there. We are we also uh, booked in CIAL in 2024 um, in France in order also to drive that. So there is a huge opportunity. We're taking it one at a time. Priority number one is for the GCC before expanding further. That sounds great. I mean, there's so much opportunity ahead of you. Um, very exciting times for you at House of Pops. Uh, Mazen, I want to thank you so much for taking the time uh, for coming in for the discussion today. Wish you all the success for the future. And thank you so much for your time again. Thank you. Thank you for hosting me. It's a pleasure. And I'm looking forward to uh, have more partnership together. Thank you. Thank you. Economic Impact. Conversations from Emirates Development Bank.